So the question is, what have your interactions been like with other members of the African diaspora? Specifically, what, and also what have your interactions been like with members of your own cultural community? Can you speak to some of the differences in the things that you've observed between the communities? I guess I can start. Um, so, I moved to the U.S. when I was 13. Um, I remember at O'Donnell Middle School in Ailey uh, meeting a girl who had a name that I recognized as Nigerian, her last name. And I remember being like, oh, you're Nigerian, I'm Nigerian, oh my god, this is exciting. Except in a very Nigerian accent, right? And she's <laughs> looking at me like, yeah, no, 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 Goodness, I don't know anything about really other than the media. And here's someone that I'm thinking is my kid folk, and you know she just didn't recognize me. And you know later on we have this conversation. I was angry about this for many years. That you know she says, you know my parents are Nigerian, but I'm not. And I'm like, oh god. Like what does that mean? You know, but but it's taken me a while to now really understand like where that comes from. And granted, yeah, it's the same girl, you know, with 13. So I'm sure even now she may, you know, she could be in this room or she could be someone who struggling to identify. As Nigerian, but I just think quickly started to realize that there, there are these, you know, in, in America there are all these labels and like how people identify, and it's so important. Um, and now I really strongly in the freedom to self identify. So, you know, I say Nigerian American because I put Nigerian first in America, and if someone else were to say they're American Nigerian, I'd be like, okay, like that's how you identify yourself because that's how you feel about that. In my mind, there are all these splits, right? So there's the, um, What's the word? JJC or the FOB term for like the recently got here from the continent. There are the a lot of my friends who were born in America, but you know they have Nigerian names, and then they're who are African American. There are you know all different sort of layers to it, and, and navigating all of those things without offending people, and sort of how they figure out their like complex identity. I think it's just really interesting. Um, but I think all of these communities have things in common. One, because we all look the same, right? Like at the end of the day when certain kinds of um, incidents happen in America, you know, that are very tense at the end of the day. I, I look at another Nigerian who maybe just got here and was like, no, I'm not so black, I'm Nigerian. I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> like, good luck with that. Um, but obviously there's still a need for explaining and understanding and education that I came to, really mostly in college, that I can be Nigerian and I can be black and I can even be African American to someone and none of them be offensive. <laughs> okay, so does anyone else want to uh, comment about their what their interactions with other members of the African diaspora have been like? Uh, interactions between members of their own community, cultural community, differences and similarities? When we first migrated to the United States, I was 13 um, as well, and I went to J. Long Middle School. I guess fortunately for me, J. Long was predominantly Hispanic, you know, students. So I was at J. Long with most of the other African, you know, children, but most of them were being here longer than I am. Again, just like you felt, I was like, well, they look African, I think they are. Uh, so in the cafeteria one day, I walked up to this girl, I think, I believe she was from Somalia, and I was like, I didn't ask if she was African, I already knew she was, I just said, are you from Somalia? Because I always get Somalia and Philippians confused, and she's like, I'm not African, uh, okay. And I just sat next to her. I didn't say anything else. I just sat there and then the next day, um, again, same thing, same girl. I was like, I know she is. I know you are. I don't care what you say. And the next day again, I sat next to her. About a week or so, finally, um, we were outside. Um, so for J Long, we had a back room for immigrant students, you know, where they give you a little extra time to do work. She came by and she whispered, she's like, I know African. I'm like, why are you whispering? There's no one else around, you know, around us. But she was actually embarrassed. Not only was she African, she was Muslim and she was black. And then um, a, about a month later, I started taking the same school bus with her and noticed that she will have her hijab on on the bus, but then when she gets off the bus, she takes it off. I I didn't know she wore a hijab because I've only seen her in school until we started riding the bus. So for her, not only am I African, I'm also black and I'm also Muslim. So um, that 
that was not really easy. But in terms of Sierra Leoneans that were born here, I've always felt like, you know, we were all family. There was no division. I mean, you knew who was born here and you knew who migrated, but there wasn't like a, you know, definite line of discrimination between the two communities. Um, for me, I think the first, my first encounter with, uh, that I can clearly remember uh, with uh, a student from the continent happened in, I think, sixth grade. Um, a young man, a young boy named uh, Kasimbi, he was, uh, he and his family were from Kenya. You know, Kasimbi wanted to play basketball and, and, and sort of migrate and hang out with African Americans during the recess period. Um, that that would take him away from studies, that, you know, um, that it was just the wrong thing to do. Um, when I got to college, uh, I dated a young lady uh, from Zambia, um, and I recall um, clearly, you know, I recall her saying that her parents were coming to visit the university. They were coming from Africa to visit the university, so I was very excited. I was like, oh, I get to meet your parents. <laughs> well, no, I don't get to meet your parents. So those were some of my first uh, clear encounters that I can recall. Um, and then there's all of the things that I think African Americans, I was like, like we all have a story of, I think, I think, just me, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we all have some story about sort of self-hate and our sort of working through self-hate. Um, for me, I can remember uh, in the seventh grade, so, so much stuff, seventh grade, middle school, um, but, but going into um, this gifted and talented class. There were only there was only one other person that happened to sit in the class, and I can remember feeling very aware of my lips. Oh my God, big lips. Okay, and so I can I can I can recall sitting there the whole time in this primarily class, um, and and going like and holding my lips in like because I didn't want I didn't, I just. I didn't want them to be seen. And um, the other kids were looking at me like something was wrong. And I don't know how I did it, but I, I managed to hold my lips in for the entire like, hour and a half. And but when the class ended, I just, they just came. I <laughs> like purple. That's, for me, that's a very clear moment where I was, that I can remember. You know, I'm, I'm trying to work in, I'm trying to work through sort of my African, just my, my phenotypically, like the, what, you know, these lips, for what they mean, what they signify in this space. I think that uh, Kevin is right, like we are in a moment where how we define what constitutes an African American is changing. Um, like, and, and the narrative um, that is associated with that historically, um, and, and that can sort of present you know, I think some potential conflict, but I think more opportunities for dialogue like this. But there were, you know, accusations of cultural appropriation. Um, there was the, the notion that you, you know, for the African American students, you could never be African, um, and you know, um, we are the gatekeepers of what it means to be African. We hold the ticket, so you can't be African. Um, and and so I had to, you know, challenge. So all of the students to, to really sort of critically assess um, not only what it means to be African, but how Africans have traveled throughout throughout the globe, right? And so for those for that student that was Yoruba, I said, um, can, you, can you talk to me about what it means to be Yoruba or the history of the Yoruba in this space, right? Uh, in, in in America, and particularly since you you know you live in Texas, in the South, the Southern United States. Can you share, can you talk to me about that history? Because that's African American history and you should know, right? So I think it depends on the generation. Um, like my parents versus me, it's completely different. I have other opinions about A lot of people that are migrating from the continent to America, they haven't really had interactions with African Americans when they get to the continent, a lot of them have a very negative uh, perception of African Americans. And it's a very strong perception. And I think that the lady that you were dating, she said that the last person on the list would be an African American. And that really is very true with a lot of African people, especially African parents, go to college and 
we really, we're all black, and you see that in the workplace, that people don't see me as Nigerian, they see me as black. And so now when I have conversations with my aunts and my uncles, I'm kind of like, you know we're, we're the same person, like we're, we're the same. Like when people look at me, they don't think, oh my gosh, she's Nigerian, she's different. For most of my generation, I think that it's definitely a lot better, especially people that grew up here, people that went to school here, people that have interacted um, with, I guess, people that have, are African but also like went to school with uh, people that are, were born in the country or don't necessarily identify with the continent. There's that ease or there's you know a much better relationship just because we were born here and we kind of grew up together. Um, so, I mean, I know this is in this form, but it would be very interesting to get like some adult Africans with like adult African Americans and having the same type of conversation. I think that that would be, I've never seen it, but that would really be something. How would you describe the current, current relationship between the African and African American community? Is there a divide? If so, what does it stem from? You know, I work at the University of Houston and I get to interact with the students. And I, so I'll speak from that sort of angle, at least the undergraduate population, from what I've observed. Um, there is a sort of an unspoken divide from what, I mean, if I'm real about it, right? Um, please rescue me if I'm wrong, if there are any undergraduates here. There's an, un there's an unspoken divide um, uh, between Africans and African Americans on the campus and some of that is a product of the legacy of some of the things that we talked about. Um, folk coming, uh, how, the way that individuals were treated in primary school and secondary school, um, understanding that African Americans are still trying to process their own self-hate, right? Is somewhat different from how African Americans are trying to, what they're doing on campuses, right? And so for African Americans, they're going to campus, and they're on these campuses. This is the, this is the dawn of the, uh, the, the Black Studies Movement, right? The Black Arts Movement. And so we're, we're really looking at uh, the, the question of educational relevance, right? H how education speaks to our history, how it contextualizes our, our, you know, us and our identity. I don't get too many um, African students telling me that they want to be musicians. I just don't, it doesn't happen too often, right? I don't get too many African uh, students telling me that they want to be painters. It just does not happen, right? Um, but that's, you know, for African Americans, you know, it's, it's them sort of really looking at how can I change the, how can I use this to, to sort of reaffirm myself in whatever space that I can find, right? And, and, and I might be a painter, and so I'm looking at how sort of my paintings or my literature is going to uh, impact my community in some way. Um, and so to me, I think that there is a divide. Individuals like uh, uh, Kwame Nkrumah are also coming to, to Lincoln University, and it's deliberately so, because if you're going to, and, and, you know, it's, 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 it's people like Horace Van Bonn and, and uh, uh, Charles S. Johnson of Fisk University, E. Franklin Fraser of Howard University, seeing that they have to change the narrative and challenge the narrative around human rights in Africa. And in order to do that, they have to, uh, to, to work with the next generation of African leaders. And so it's not accidental that uh, Azikiwe comes to Lincoln University. And it's not accidental that he becomes president of Nigeria, right? His, his experience, he realizes, if you read his autobiography, he realizes that, you know, they're not treating me this way because I'm evil. They're treating me this way because they perceive me as, as being black. Right, and so he goes back to Nigeria and he can leave the country because he has sort of this larger perspective of what it means to be African. Uh, so um, I, I think that we have to get these narratives out there. So I've challenged some of my fellow students at UH Clear Lake where I'm a, I was formerly the president of the Black Student Association there. And at that campus, something very unique was present. We didn't have an African Student Association. We didn't have a previous student organization. We didn't have a Black Student Alliance, which tends to be more African American. We had Black Student Association as an American-born guy there, you know, 300 years deep in America as president of the organization. And I look out there, there's Caribbean people, there's African people from about nine different countries. How is this going to work? That was one of the most intimidating things I faced. 
And at the same time, one of the most thrilling and rewarding things that I face because it's like, you know what? I'm in my 50s, these are young people. We can do anything. I have adopted so many African students as brothers and sisters that we go out to eat, it really hits my pocketbook. <laughs> but on a serious level, on a personal level, I, the divide is, but I don't see a divide. I see brothers and sisters. I see potential. And from that potential, I see a way to affect the no part of the answer, where as groups, we are divided. And evidence of that division is present in the fact that we're having this discussion right now. We know that there's a divide, but here's the thing. Guess what? We're trying to do something about it. Yes, we can have very good, rewarding relationships, regardless of which country we were born in or our parents or grandparents were born in. I live that every day. Every day I live that. And it's easier to see the black and the white division than it is to see the African and the African American division. And that's actually, to me personally, it's worse than the black and white thing. Because when I look at this room, I do see, you know, my brothers and sisters. But I also see my brothers and sisters who don't. Part of them, right, haven't really grasped the identity from within. So, um, like every other behavior, this is coming from a psychological point of view, there is an unmet need, there's an defined, underlying, and unmet need that I feel like we're starting to slowly address. I think right now we are on the surface, but it's all the way down. It's, it's Part of sort of that underlying need, I think, um, an issue is, you know, for someone like me, you show up in America, you're like, hey, my people, and people are like, ugh, not, you know, not my people. Though I'm now much older and I understand that kids are evil wherever they are in the world. So obviously we are older and for me, a lot of that, you know, college, I, I joined the NAACP because my friend Michael was on the board. You know, that was it. But before that, I don't think I ever would have. Um, and then I was president of the African Student Association. And there were black people that joined the African Student Association. They always asked, wait, could, can we join? And I just remember being like, well, of course, yes, come in. You know, and now I have, you know, black friends who are like, know how to make jollof because, you know, Nigerian jollof, to be very specific. <laughs> and I make the joke about Nigerian jollof for my Ghanaians in the room, right? Because even in, you know, there's, you're talking African versus African American, but even in West Africa, in Anglophone West Africa, which is all of like less than 10 countries, we still have our, you know, baby fights about silly things. And in Nigeria, which is one country, the divide goes deeper, and then to, to where someone from here, we will say, you uh, can't marry someone from, you know, Abia State, or all the... The African continent has a lot of division there, from language, from, you know, how we perceive the one another, you look, and all of these things. And I think that where that unity can start to happen is here in the diaspora, where I see a Kenyan, and I'm like, hey, I'm African brother, you know, and it's just there's so much value that we all create for each other. But if black people worldwide were to unite, like that changes everything. Hashtag you have the murder. This one is related to Black Panther. So audience, spoiler alert. I'm going to try to bring this in a way that doesn't give away anything in the movie, but so that we can dialogue. But for those who have seen the movie Black Panther, um, there are many themes, characters, and circumstances that can be viewed as allusions to the divide between the African and African American community. Um, so I have an example, but I want to—I just want to hear from the panel. For me, the biggest question that I took from the film, I think that the film raises, is what if Africa had, or Africans, had been allowed to develop their own resources unmolested by the transatlantic slave trade, Europe's World War II, Europe's World War II, Europe's World War I, Europe's World War II, and all the colonialism, how much for the advance, you know, they would be. What that would mean for African people everywhere else in the world. In addition to what you said, I felt like the movie was, again, scratching that surface, you know, for conversations like this. I just, like, watching the movie, I just, I just felt like there's an, an unspoken anger 
between the two communities that kind of should be voiced. I guess even with my, for my African American friends or just the, I don't know, I just sense that, what's the word, um, that tension between communities. I don't fully like understand like why, why, why is that anger, like why would you be upset? <laughs> Jordan's character, Eric Killmonger, experienced an anger and rage that some would say captures the way a lot of African Americans feel towards African people. We want to know if you agree, if you think the rage is justifiable. I'll sort of speak to the last two questions real quick. So, watching the movie, I, what's funny is, I was in Nigeria on Wednesday and that's where I watched the movie uh, for the first time. You know, watching that and having conversations with people for, you know, 30 minutes to an hour after about like what they think. And then hop on the plane, come back to the U.S., watch it on Saturday and, you know, enter all these communities that are having conversations. So I feel like for me it was a very unique experience because one, Nigerians are talking about how they feel like, well, you know, Wakanda was something that like the, the, the promise of it was stolen, you know, with colonialism. In the African community, we don't really there isn't this come to Jesus moment about like what happened in the 1800s you know like like what and I don't I've never learned that anywhere right? this sounds ridiculous but I didn't know about slavery until I moved to America so I'm talking to a black friend in high in middle school and I'm like so where, like, where are you from and they're like you know Dallas and I'm like no like but like before that they're like Dallas and then I'm like okay well like Okay, your grandparents, and they're like, Virginia? Like, I don't, like, that's it. I was just gonna comment. I, I saw the movie, and the reason I saw the movie is because I had so many friends that were commenting on it, and I knew there was a conversation happening, and I needed to find out what's going on. People got a lot of positive uh, inspiration from that movie, and I wanted to figure out what, what is it that people are seeing that is creating this. I saw tribes, various tribes from all over different parts of Africa represented in there. And I said, hmm, this is pretty cool. Some of these tribes, they kind of go along. Some of them have conflict, and then sometimes they resolve the conflict. But when you get to African American, you have more of the individual that comes and is going to become king. He's not even part of an African American tribe. He's his own person, almost. I think the tribal part was very interesting for me. That was very interesting. It's like you can have these tribes work together in the same nation. Now, if we can just get one African nation to actually do that. What can be done to achieve a greater level of unity and togetherness between the African and African American communities? And specifically, what needs to be done individually and collectively to mend the bridge? As far as us getting together, okay, Let's think about the consequences of not getting together. What I see in making connections with people from various parts of the world is that we have a little bit of these shields and preconceptions and stereotypes. Who are you really? But let's at least establish some rapport, respect for one another, let's get to the deeper level, and not just talk about the problem and how bad stuff is. We have got to identify solutions. For African Americans, there's been a struggle to understand themselves, but there has to also be sort of a, 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 a conscious and critical attempt to understand Africa and Africans and all Africa's sort of varied dimensions. Um, at this point, there's really, there's little excuse for African Americans if you want to find out sort of your background. Um, there's so much. Here in the city of Houston, there's the Clayton Genealogical Library. It's, it's one of the top five genealogical libraries in the country. It's free. Houston Public Library Card. I mean, it's absolutely free. You can find out so much about where you come from with that library. Um, and I also believe in the power of art. I think art is transformative. I, 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 one of my students boarded me a, um, it was a YouTube of Afro-Brazilians watching uh, what is it, the, the, the Black Panther, and their comment on, just the commentary on, on the Black Panther, and so it's just like, that's awesome, like, yes, we can have these dialogues on our own terms. Right? We're part of a group, Young African Professional. Um, I think that there's something that we can do, and I love to hear kind of feedback.
what are some things that we can do um, to make sure that we, you know, kind of cater to this topic and mend the bridge within our generation, within our demographic. I was going to add that um, I think for me personally, it's basically starting to ask ourselves, who are we? It's not about where do you know do I come from? Who am I? Because when you ask yourself, even as an individual, regardless of where you're from, who am I? in your developmental stage, right? If you can truly answer that, and then it leads you to asking for more, um, basically, finding more answers. Because it start with finding out who we are, you know, each and every one of us as individuals, even as an African, you know. I know my parents are from Sierra Leone. I'm sure my great, 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 great grandfather didn't come from Sierra Leone. So going back and tracing roots for all of us, not just African Americans, because I think we have a lot of problems within our communities as Africans because we really don't know who we are or we don't want to know who we are. It's almost like we're also scared. I don't know what, but there's a fear inside of us. We don't ask questions. It's easy to just label. A lot of Africans that are not Nigerians <laughs> feel offended, and this is clear. If you're not Nigerian in this room and you're African, you are offended every time somebody said, are you Nigerian? No, I'm not. Very sorry, guys. We're going to transition to the Q&A uh, for the sake of time. I like what you said about um, combing through the gray areas of yourself and find who you are within yourself. In 2016, I got to talk to Nigeria. Okay. When I got there, my experience was the best experience ever. I experienced the bad, the worst, the ugly, and I experienced the most awesome of it all. And, and it was it was shocking, but it didn't bother me because it's like, who you said, I know who I am, you know who I am, you like to I am when I was a kid. The only problem was people trying to shift me this way and that way. You know, sitting at a table, we have discussions and we have a Nigerian just trying to tell you what you guys need to do when they never traveled outside of your own country. Same with us, you know, we have that same ignorance as African Americans, but um, for me, one of the biggest things for me is like, getting to know who you are. One of the things that was said to me is like, you know, you're acting, you act like you've been in Nigeria before, right? And my response was, I have too many friends who have taught me better to come over here and act like adults. You know, I'm just in Nigeria real time, you know? So I knew about Napa, I knew about taking cold shots in a bucket because I did it here. I said, okay, let me take it back. will incentivize Africans specifically to want to reach out to African Americans, being that we already have this like negative perception of African Americans. So how do we do that? I mean, these are African Americans, they've been through slavery, they've been through, you know, Jim Crow. And even in Nigeria too, like in Africa, like how colonialism uh, affected Nigerians is totally different than how colonialism affected South Africans. Why, why should we? Like, you talk to a Nigerian, he's like, okay, why should I do business with that? I got that boy, if I can do business with so God. I think that there is value to, if I were going to do business, at least someone that looks like me. At my law, the law firm where I used to work, um, I was the only Nigerian associate there, but there was a black partner, right? And so like, she automatically becomes my mentor. African American people, African people, we get called enough names already. I think there's some negative names we get out there, we need to stop calling each other names. Mm -hmm. We just, that's something we can do easy, just stop using that term. You know, start using the B word, the N word, and now we got the A word, but whatever word we got, if it doesn't speak clearly, brother and sister, we need to get rid of that. 
the other day, there's the danger of single story. I always mention to Amanda and Gozi, the danger of a single story, and how she's always talking about how we look at one another and we just go based off of the stereotypes that we hear of one another, and how the stereotypes may not be un all the way untrue, but they're incomplete, and the goal is to talk to one another, have conversation, listen with, the in listen with the intent to understand, not with the intent to reply. So I'm really happy that you all showed up and you all um, decided to be brave. Like I said at the beginning, courageous, because this is a brave move, this is um, a vulnerable move, you know, and I'm really happy you all showed up. Thank you so much for coming and just give yourselves again a round of applause. I came um, to basically learn Basically, I'm Nigerian, Nigerian American. Both my parents are born in born in Nigeria, raised in Nigeria. They moved here in 1979. I was born here in 1981, born and raised in Houston. So I guess I'm like what you call the best of both worlds. What were you hoping to gain from this event today? To gain, what I wanted to gain was really just, I just wanted to listen to hear ideas from both sides because I, I, I truly feel like I'm, I'm the product of being born in, in America and being that I'm from Nigeria. So I just wanted to see what how we can mend both sides together because there is a divide somehow. Um, I'm glad the Black Panther came out because the show it brought it brought knowledge, it brought it brought an awareness from African Americans to want to be a part of the culture, to want to be a part of the, the African, to even want to be revered as African. So it's a good thing. How do you identify with the African American community and the African community? Easily, because. When you check on the box on your report, it says African American. I'm African. I'm truly an African American. I was born and raised in America, and my family is from, from Nigeria. Have you been to Africa before? All the time. Back and forth. I do business out there. So, yeah, I'm really in, I'm out there. And I feel the same way out there when I go out there. They don't look, they look at me as a foreigner. They, I'm, I get called Yankee and this and that. The way they call Nigerians call Americans a kata, they call me Yankee. So pretty much, pretty much the same. There's a lot of, it's a lot of, there's a lot of division. No matter where it is, black, African countries, tribes, it's, it's always division with the blacks. And that's why I think this is a good. This was a good event to go to come to, and this was a good place to to hear and for people to come together and know that it is a problem that we do need to come together. We do need to mend the bridge. I feel like African Americans are condescending towards the culture, and I feel like Africans are arrogant towards their culture. Everybody can celebrate anybody's culture. You are know one. One word. I am, and in one word, I am not. One word. I am African. In one word. I just saw an invitation across my Facebook timeline. What made it interesting? Um, well, I obviously had just watched Black Panther and uh, had a lot of thoughts. Uh, for me, I'm friends with Christiana Thompson, who is one of the organizers of this event. So uh, she had mentioned how important this was to her, and I think it's, a, it's an important conversation as well. So does everybody here have a bias toward the African culture? Um, I think for me it's a natural bias just because I am Nigerian and that's the culture that was taught to me. Um, my parents are Nigerian so I think with whatever ethnicity, whatever culture that you are born to, you're gonna have a natural bias to that. Um, but I think as you get older, your bias is kind of can shift a little bit where you're not just um, singling out just being African or being Nigerian. You're now open to you know other cultures, other ethnicities that you come in contact with or people that are different um, backgrounds. I, I actually skew the other way, so I think I'm. Um, in conversations like this, I tend to be more empathetic towards uh, African Americans because I feel based on knowing, even though I am African, knowing the history of African Americans and understanding some of the difficulties that they've encountered gener generationally, I think that uh, makes me more sympathetic to 
trying to reach out to bridge the gap as opposed to kind of steeping myself in my own culture and sticking that way. Is there more of a divide now between Africans and African Americans than there have been before or do you think that is changing? I, I think there's less of a, uh, less of a divide and uh, also I think that um, there's a lot of parallels. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Pan-Africanist, and with Pan-Africanism, Marcus Garvey, Kwame Nkrumah, I think there's a lot of parallels between the Black Power movement and Black Panthers. So, I mean, it's, maybe you could say there was a lot, maybe in the past, but I think now it's kind of more similar. We have more similarities, and I think we can you know, work together. What do you guys think about the event? The event was very open, very informative. I thought it was good. I thought the audience was engaged. I thought it was, um, the questions were good. I think it, you know, again, was the beginning of a conversation. I think there's a lot more to be said and done, but at least we started the conversation. Uh, I felt the, I felt this event, this event was the more progressive events that uh, I've been to centered around this kind of topic. So um, I, I kind of felt like people were, especially after the movie, I felt like people were just kind of waiting to have this kind of event and really just come, come together, so. Yeah, I think the balance of the panel, for me being African-American, you know, that was one thing I was kind of worried about coming here, like who was going to be on the panel? So the balance of uh, Africans and African Americans and the, how informed they were mm. in how kind of like unbiased of it all, you know, their point of view and where they've been was very good for this type of um, forum because, you know, there was no clashing, you know, amongst the panelists. So that was, that was good to see. What would be the most important step to bridging the divide between Africans and African Americans, in your opinion? Uh, well, I think if we just keep having sessions like this and continue working on bridging the gap, you know, a series like this was really good. We made a great first step. I heard a lot of different voices, so I thought it was really informational. So if we just keep this type of consistency. I think we could. And I also believe, like, with each personal growth where we find ourselves, it's up to us individually to, from one individual to one individual, to close any type of um, misinformation between the two, between African and African.